The topic we're going to talk about, mainly resilience, is one of those areas that has got more attention, relatively more attention in research, almost in any area I can think of. And I know this because earlier on this year, what I did was I looked at uh, one of the, the sites that t- uh, tell you um, how many times a particular word appeared in the title of a scholarly paper. And what I found was that from 2009 to 2016, the word resilience was seven times more common than it had been at the earlier time. Seven times. Now you might say, ah yeah, but there's more papers published. And you're right. But I took a few control words, like stress. Stress doubled. Resilience went up seven times. Now I'm interested in that because why is it that resilience is a thing that people talk about so much? What is it about resilience? And part of that, I'm, I, my background is psychology, but I'm also interested in sociology and why people st- study particular topics at certain times. And there is a kind of economic sort of, especially in the US at the moment, you stand on your own feet. You don't get hammered. And that's, that's, that's a big thing. So there's a kind of a, an emphasis on resilience. It's not just an accident that it, it, that it happens to be there. The other interesting point about um, resilience is that the recent research has been quite interdisciplinary. So while I'm going to talk a good deal about the psychology of resilience, it's also relevant to to sociology. Why it is particularly social, uh, in particular societies, resilience is especially relevant. Um, Social psychology is relevant because we'll talk in in this about attribution. Why is it? that people see the particular problems that occur as caused by whatever it is. So it is an interdisciplinary topic. Now, um, we'll, 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 we'll visit that. What I'd like, if it were possible, um, to, um, to, for, for you would be, we look at various themes. About half the work I'm going to talk about is my own research, pu- publications that I did. Uh, uh, the other half of it ranges in, from various areas. But what I'd like you to do, maybe, is to look at commonalities, to see is there something that emerges that you could say when you encounter some adversity or somebody in your family does or your community or whatever, you'd say, well, what was relevant there? Because the, the, the range of, of disciplines and the range of variables that have been examined have increased Quite, uh, uh, quite systematically. The other thing uh, would be to look at events, because one of the things that's clear is that one time we thought of events when in, in, in behaviorism, in psychology. If it was positive, it was good for you. If it was negative, it was bad for you. Now we know that an awful lot of other things come into play, that are things to do with perception of an event, what caused the event. So that will be a, a, a relevant theme in this. I'll give you an overview of what uh, we'll talk about. Um, I looked up some early papers. In the early days, there was no particular great interest in anything except they used to ca- talk about hardiness. If you look up that, you'll see there were some in the 80s. Some people were tougher than others. So it was kind of get up, up there and, and move on. Don't be sorry for yourself and whatever. That was that kind of view. Very little emphasis on the social in the early days. I will then talk a bit about children's resilience because after all, more attention and more research has been given to children's resilience than any other aspect. And we'll talk a bit about that. I'll also talk about uh, teaching because that's the one I know most about and where I've done my research. Uh, about setbacks and adverse things that happen to teachers and what we can learn from those. All the time looking at the commonality. I'll then talk about uh, the, the nature of coping, because after all, coping, coping is a major one. Uh, always very significant to anticipate. What, what I did, um, I was thinking tonight before I came out, I'd be concerned that, uh, this is the only joke I'm going to tell you, uh, I hope you laugh. Uh, sorry, uh, that's uh, one of the things I always find is if, it, if a lecturer is talking about a topic and if there's some contradiction between the topic and what he actually, how he presents it. 
So I was thinking that the disaster, which I almost was half right about, was that I said, suppose the PowerPoint doesn't work. What am I going to do? Because I've seen so many people who messed up with PowerPoint, especially in the early days. So what I did was, as my contribution to resilience, I brought, uh, I brought, uh, took a photocopy, made a few copies, and I'm ready if the PowerPoint didn't work. That was my uh, effort, to, because I didn't want to be caught out. As I remember, uh, this is the incident I think is funny, about 20 years ago, I was at a lecture in the U.S., I won't say which university because the professor doesn't come well out of this. He was talking about the effects of violence on the audience uh, when they watch a violent film. That they're grumpy and in bad form afterwards. And buskers know that. They know that they'll take up less money outside a violent film than they will one that warms people's hearts. So he, he, he was making this point. And in 10 minutes into the presentation, he said, Becky, for Christ's sake, well, so to that effect, will you leave down that paper? And I thought, I'm the only one here who knows why he did that. What he's done is, because this is an eminent professor we're talking about, he wants to illustrate how an angry comment has an effect on the atmosphere in a room, which it certainly had. So the presentation went on an hour and a half, and I waited, and I said, it's funny that he doesn't mention it yet. And he didn't. It was just that he lost his cool, and I was over, and I was over-interpreting his behavior. So there you are. Uh, I, I always thought of that because I used the same tactic a few times afterwards, except in my case, I did actually simulate and work it out with somebody that I would eat the face off them, and then you'd see, they said, we thought he was nice, so I would tell them. But anyway, now, um, the, thing, uh, the final thing we talk about then is to do with resilience and mental health, especially depression. We'll, we'll take that. The general framework that we find as regards resilience is that there are three major factors. The first one is social, is social support. Virtually every study of resilience and the ones we'll talk about, social support is a major factor in that. The second broad uh, resilience is assets. And when I say assets, I don't mean necessarily assets in relation to what contributed to the adverse event you encountered, but rather something good in your life. Maybe, and it, often it doesn't seem to be directly relevant, and there's some interesting examples of that. Um, coping, and coping different coping styles. We'll talk a lot about those, particularly the distinction between problem solving and rumination. And uh, also coping, there's a great emphasis in recent times on coping flexibility, that you don't just have one solution for any problem you have, but that you have a flexible, you have a range of solutions uh, in, in, in that. Now, the other thing I'm going to mention at the outset is has to do with the, the right to be able to acknowledge adversity. The reason this is important, because sometimes when things go wrong in people's lives, they don't have any right to, to acknowledge that or to say this is what happened to me for some reasons. The one I'll mention is grief. Um, there's um, a sociologist called Ken Doka who has put forward the idea of disenfranchised grief. And what he's referring to in that is that for some things, if some of your family die, normally you can grieve, you have a right to grieve, that's it. But suppose it's somebody with whom you've been having an affair, that's different. It may be different if it's your gay lover. And that, in, in some cases of grief, say for example, a pet, that a child has sometimes. They don't have the right to grieve sometimes. In some circumstances, yes. Also, there are some groups, like, for example, people with intellectual disabilities. They would, tradition would be, nobody says you have no right to grieve, but what they do is they don't let them know that somebody died in their family. 
or they suppress it, or they say something else, or they say, ah, oh, they've just gone to heaven, that's it, they'll be back, kind of. Um, so that, that's a very important consideration. And it's that, um, that right. And it's also very relevant in a lot of other things. If somebody loses a million books, to us, that might be a great setback. To other people, it isn't. But a, an awful lot ties in with self-esteem, with where you value things. Uh, in, 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 the, in those circumstances. Now, let's look at some of the issues to do with um, uh, children's uh, resilience. Um, we know from... The, there's a long tradition of knowing about adverse circumstances in childhood and how these bring about. We know, for example, in the, uh, John Bowlby studied maternal deprivation in the 1950s. Then there was the... Uh, child sexual abuse. Um, you had a, a, a whole range of concern about that and a lot of literature on that. Uh, conflict between, within families and violence in families. Um, more recently, there's an emphasis on children as carers and how that impacts on them, where children have to take care of other children in the family. So you've got a whole range of things in childhood. For me, one of the most interesting studies that has been published in the last year is one on TILDA. TILDA is the National Longitudinal Study of Aging. And it's, it's now about 10 years there, and people were, their youngest age group, in the age group were 50, uh, and 10 years later, they've done several follow-up. One of the most interesting ones was that, that I found was a study published last year. And what it looked at was adversity in childhood and later disease. And what it showed is that other things being controlled, that somebody who experienced adversity like abuse, poverty, a whole range of things, it had a huge impact on their physical health. That was the interesting one. Like their likelihood of getting cancer, likelihood of heart disease. Now that, that to me in the literature, we all know about psychological effects that happen uh, from childhood, but to actually find that you had physical effects as well, particularly the two I mentioned, and they did that having controlled for other factors. I thought, I thought that was really interesting. So that adversity in childhood isn't just about psychological consequences at all, but rather, rather other, other things as well. Um, intergenerational effects we know uh, between generations, that's well established. Um, particularly in the case of violence, particularly in the case of abuse. Um, what are the critical factors? If we could say, what are the factors that make a difference? A huge one is multiple adverse events. I wouldn't say it's a huge exaggeration, but it is true that children can get over one event, even a major one that's grave difficulty. But where their problem arises is if you have knock-on effects as a result of that. The example I give there is, say, is parental substance use. If you have somebody in the family on drugs or on alcohol, the chances of there being parental conflict, of being separations, of resulting in various things, that's where the problem is. Um, there's a very good paper by uh, Trevor Spratt in uh, the Children's Research Centre in Trinity College on uh, adversity, and he identifies multiple adversity, that several things going wrong, as being probably the one that makes the, makes the biggest difference. I think that's a, that's a very interesting one. The, benefit, the beneficial effects of assets. I'll just start with a study Mavis Hetherington did uh, 30 years ago. She studied the effects of divorce on children. And interestingly, what she found was that children got over their parents' divorce more easily if they were doing well in school. Now, that's interesting. What has doing well in school to do with your parents splitting up? The answer is apparently very little. But that's a common theme, that assets over here have a beneficial effect on a negative experience here. And, and that has been borne out since um, in, 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 in quite a number of studies. There is certainly, continuing on that theme, there's, for any adverse event, 
that you, you get all the time, you get uh, impacts. Um, you get uh, social support um, inside and outside the family that emerges there in the, in the experience of children. But there's also one other one I'd like to mention, and that's the impact of how somebody, how a child experiences an event. What is it? What does it mean to them? How is it conveyed to them? How is it explained to them? I can just give you this in terms of my own experience of life. Uh, <clears throat> my father died seven months before I was born. To me, by the time I realized what fathers were about, I used to look around and see the dads I knew. And I wouldn't particularly like any of them because all they did was stop people having fun. So to me, it meant somebody, not, I, there was somebody there who, uh, I didn't have somebody around who didn't cause me having fun. I mean, that's literally true. I did miss, uh, funny enough, as I got older and had my own children, it became a bit more relevant. Take that, compare that to the other, my older brothers and sisters, my uh, eldest sister, who found the note telling her, telling the teacher, that her father had died an hour ago, dropped dead in the field, and she, miss, she intercepted the note. That's a different, different experience to mine, of the same event. So what, I, what I'm saying to you is that people's experience of something, how it's conveyed, how it's mediated, makes a huge difference uh, in, 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 in that. Attribution is a huge factor. We now know if hardiness isn't that important, certainly attribution has taken over from it. What attribution refers to is how do you explain the event? And the big distinction is between do you blame yourself or do you blame people out there? Or if you do see it as somehow reflecting on yourself, how much do you see it as reflecting on you generally? But what we do know about children is that, for example, frequently when their parents split up, they think it's their fault. They'll think if they did better in school, maybe daddy wouldn't drink as much. Or if they did better in school, maybe something else would happen. That, that, the, 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 that attribution factor uh, is, is uh, it, um, um, quite a, a, a major influence. Um, there are recent um, uh, studies that I won't go into because we haven't time, uh, which have looked at various things like the time in people's lives. There's a, a great interest now in late adoptions versus early adoptions of children. That, that's a, 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 an important one. Um, also, the timing of an event. There's, a, there's very interesting work on uh, the, the leak of radiation um, in Chernobyl and the point, the age young children were, the age the fetus was, uh, at the time, uh, at what, at what um, in between 8 and 25 weeks seem to be particularly pertinent. So that there is, we're going back to what used to be called critical periods uh, uh, as being very significant. The other thing I should mention, of course, there is that in all this explanation, physiological um, explanation is, is uppermost. And you'll virtually find nothing now on resilience that doesn't add a physiological dimension to the psychosocial one uh, in that. Adverse events in teaching. Uh, I just say very briefly, well, there are a lot of things that matter um, and that have uh, fair influences, changes in society, changes in interaction with parents. I just mentioned two sort of uh, distinctions. One is to do with the fact that some things are preventable. Policies that governments pursue and departments of education pursue, they're sometimes, they're there all the time and teachers can find them a bit stressful. They're kind of chronic. So I did a study on uh, what makes teachers stress, what stresses teachers. And there's an interesting thing is the same emerged, this was with primary teachers, same emerged with post-primary. The big thing that drove them all mad was paperwork unnecessary paperwork, paper that they didn't see, which is quite preventable. The overcrowded curriculum was a factor, but not nearly as important as the bureaucracy that had come in. So I found that quite interesting that it was. Now, what I'm going to do now, though, is go on to talk about 
the ordinary. Um, and of course, the reason that this is so relevant, I just mentioned, is attrition. Uh, in the UK and in the US, people who qualify as teachers, 50% have left within five years. We don't have an issue like that yet, um, but it's, it's, it's an important consideration. Um, now, let's look at ordinary, I mentioned policies and people's reaction to them and stresses. What about the emotional life, the daily life of a teacher? What does it look like? What makes a difference? And what influences uh, how, how they fare out? This paper is called, what, if you want to have a look at Google, what makes teachers tick, that emerges. Uh, so wh wh what I wanted to see was, what's the day look like? And what influences that day? So what I had is 749 teachers over six weeks, no less than that. And what they did, they kept diaries at the end of each week. And what the question was, what made you feel good this week? Three things that made you feel good, th three things that made you feel bad. And there was a number of interesting things. Positive events happened and negative events. The two happened. Um, what emerged uh, particularly was that it was frequency of particular negative events that mattered more than intense events. In other words, the day tended to be, or the week was regular enough, nothing that spectacular, but that there were a lot of things that annoyed them at times. So it was frequency. Uh, that, that when we asked them about ratings, very few things got the highest rating, up to 9 or 10, that this was a big deal, that this was a big emotional. But what did matter was frequency, that an awful lot of things nagged them, annoyed them, whatever, like that. Um, major events occurred only seldom. Uh, they all rated at a child disclosing they had been abused abused as being the worst thing that could happen, the strongest thing. Um, one teacher of the 749 reported that. Now, um, wh 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 what can we say? What we can say about this is that for, t for their job satisfaction, and we established a measure of their job satisfaction, for their job satisfaction, it was the absence, it was the presence, if they, ha if they had positive events, they could put up with negative events. But it was the absence of positive events that made them dissatisfied. In other words, the nature of their day was grand, provided that there were some good things that counterbalanced the negative things. I thought that was interesting. The other thing that mattered is that we asked about where did the events come from that they experienced. And virtually always, this could be at national level, it could be at school level, or it could be here in your own class. The nearer it was to you, the more impact it had. So in terms of what teachers experience, it's not the national policy so much as how that policy comes to bear, is translated uh, to themselves. I'm now going to show you what uh, one of the teachers said in the school in, I think it was December, about four years ago. What made you feel good this week? Children showed greater understanding of the concepts involved in recycling and composting. Some told how they got their parents to recycle. I felt how their learning was worthwhile and how teaching can really make a difference. Brilliant. That's the highest rating it could get, 10. Same teacher, there were three things, there's, there's two of them. A child completed the sentence, scrambling exercise, recalling words learned since last September, completely and independently. I felt the work was really paying off. Great. In the same school, in the same week, this. What made you feel bad this week? This is the same school and the same week. In the staff room, a teacher made a remark that some of my previous class cannot read. I feel so worried that I didn't do enough of them. Was my teaching good enough? Is it good enough at the moment? Are children losing out by being in my class? That's the highest rating, negative rating, the person could give. Started by what? Johnny can't read, and it's your fault. Except nobody said it's your fault, but it triggered off. But see the speed with which going from a tiny little remark, 
to really feeling I'm useless. A little girl in the class is really struggling. This is the same teacher. I feel uncertain as to what I should do and feel guilty that I haven't done enough to date. I'm frustrated with a mum who won't turn up to parent-teacher meetings, hasn't got all her books. Nearly as bad. Now, I told you a little fib. What was the fib I told you? They're authentic. I thought, you see, from what I know of halo effects, I thought that if you had that, you couldn't have the next. That if you had, if you had brilliant feeling like that, how could you be so uh, obsessed by something else the very same week? So I, I think that's, that's um, extremely interesting. Now, of course, the person involved will, will, will work that out, I'm assuming, and whatever. But, but it does show you that you, that, uh, that, that balance is, is, uh, is, is very significant. Now, what um, uh, I did afterwards was uh, a follow-up study to see what is it about events that really make people, um, how, how teachers recover. Um, co- colleagues, the imp- importance of colleagues was absolutely crucial. A holistic dimension as well. Life outside school made a huge difference. If people were happy with school, if everything or outside school, if things were going well outside school, then you could get over something easily inside school. Uh, also, the capacity to bounce back is different from general efficacy. It's not the same. Um, and colleagues can help just by talking, by putting things in context and, and, and so on like that. Now, let's then... Uh, move on. Uh, why is it that some events that happen to people, I'm going to run through this quickly, some events that happen to people, they get depressed over them, events and other people, they, uh, other events get over them. Why, what is it about an, an event and the consequences that make some people depressed and some people get over them? Particularly positive emotions. We know now that positive and negative emotions, as we saw a minute ago, coexist. But positive emotions have a huge influence. There's a a broaden and build theory by Fredrickson, this idea that that it enhances your efficacy and capacity if you experience uh, positive emotions. Humor is very important because what it does is it reduces uh, tension and attracts social support and has a great influence in, in, in resilience. And uh, th- this, this, this is one that um, has been shown repeatedly. How people attribution makes a great difference. We've said that again. If you think that the event is permanent, that that's the way I am, then that's a negative impact. And if it's pervasive. However, if, if you see an event as limited, that it's not all my life, it's that, then it's not nearly as much. The other thing that there's a lot of now is uh, talk about is post-traumatic growth. In other words, that sometimes events can be good for you. I'm a little bit suspicious because I've seen a few papers, for example, two papers on child sexual abuse that asked somebody who was abused, uh, were, were there any positive effects? And they said, yes, like I'm aware with my kids or something like that. I'd be very worried about that uh, because of what it really, uh, it can be easily, totally misinterpreted. And... Um, uh, the, the post-traumatic growth can be relevant, uh, but uh, I, 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 I wouldn't be as convinced um, as some people are that it's a, 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 an important concept. Now, uh, the other one is, has to do with spirituality and altruism, that people often who experience tragedy and negative events often help people who've gone through the same thing, and that can help. Social support in terms of an event that happens and its impact on depression is a major factor. What social support does is enhance physical health, reduce high-risk behavior, counteracts loneliness. It does all of those uh, things like that. The other thing is that natural mentors, uh, like, for example, teachers, coaches, they can have a very um, profound effect in uh, helping people. Um, and coping style. The big distinction is between a problem solving, going to do something about something 
versus rumination. And you consistently find that uh, avoidant uh, rumination uh, results in a, in a higher level of, of symptoms. Now, there are some other things. There's substantial evidence that exercise uh, helps people get over an event and prevents them from getting into depression. However, you have to be aware of methodological factors because people who are uh, take exercise are often different, so that there's, there's some difficulty there. The other thing is that all of the events that I've talked to you about that make a difference in resilience, that they interact with each other. Um, social and coping factors, spirituality and positive feelings, they all, coping style and social support, they all help each other. It isn't that you can take one of those and say, that's a separate thing, it's, it's the way they are. There's one that I found, uh, a paper that's just published by Grubbs and X-Line, uh, published in the last three weeks, I think. And it's an interesting one. It brings us back to hardiness almost. Um, it's the propensity to entitlement, that some people feel that they have a right to, they're entitled to good things to happen to them. And that's not a good experience to have in the face of negative events. What surprised me about it is that that comes out as a stable, a reliable trait and that that notion of a sense of entitlement is itself something that can be measured and works uh, because what it brings about is um, a vulnerability to um, unmet expectations uh, and it's a trait, as I said, that's quite pervasive. Um, so in a way, we've come all the way from... Um, um, we've come all the way from a time where we, we thought hardiness was what mattered uh, right now to where it's not so much that uh, what really matters now is, isn't so much a, a trait as the way we see things and attribute things. That's a, that's a major factor. The other thing, um, uh, two other things I'll say finally to you is that... Uh, Resilience is now relevant, I've talked about it as, at an individual level, it's now relevant to ethnic groups, to cultures, where there's a put-down of um, a whole um, range of communities. And what, what's known about that uh, from some study uh, research in the Middle East is that generally the same factors seem to apply as apply at the individual level. But that's an area that will certainly get... Uh, if, if, if all of the group that you belong to are put down as something, uh, then you know, you, the same issues ar arise about resilience. Um, this final question that I, I saw raised in a paper today was, does resilience exact a toll? In other words, is there a cost? And there's some evidence that it does. That even people who uh, psychosocially seem to recover and do very well, that they may sometimes experience... Uh, physical health symptoms. So it may be, maybe it comes at a price. What I'd say with certainty is that it's an area that's going to continue to expand. It's an area because it, it, it has that mix that, it, that it's worth doing. I'll stop. Thank you.